This is the YouTube Conversation today with Rochelle Lefebvre, one of the stars of Barney's Version, which finds its world premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival. Nice to see you Hello. back. Hello. Nice to see you back in Canada. Thank you. Nice to be back in Canada, always. <laughs> and, well, you live in LA, but you have two films at the festival this year, both of which I think were, well, they're both Canadian films, not both were shot in Canada. They entirely. were. Yeah. They were. I mean, I shot Barney's version in, uh, I shot my portion of Barney's mm -hmm. version in Rome, mm -hmm. but the film is predominantly shot yeah. in Montreal, and Casino Jack is predominantly shot, well, I think maybe entirely shot in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Tell me a little bit about working in Rome. And I was just there uh, a few months ago, and honestly, the traffic blew my mind. Everything was so hard to get around. It's a very bustling, alive, happening city. What mm -hmm. was it, did that create challenges for you guys shooting? Um, you know what, once we got to our locations, the sort of traffic and the bustlingness of the city wasn't really an issue because we were in quieter, you know, for my stuff, we were really in, uh, when we were interior, we were in sort of quieter, controlled locations. Um, and then when we were outside and like in the cafe scene, you know, and having dinner at, you know, four in the morning, that was, perfect. Right. You want that energy. So I think it fed the film. It's funny you should mention the traffic in Rome because actually it was one of the things that I was um, sort of in awe of was uh, I had this moment where I was um, driving from one location to the next. You, you drove? And uh, well no I was in the car. In Someone the car. else was okay. driving okay. and I was in the car and they were driving me from one location to the next and we're stuck in traffic and the driver is complaining about the traffic and he's in a foul mood. <laughs> Lovely guy, but in a foul mood because of the traffic. And I'm looking in like the windows of the cars next to me and the cars, you know, stuck in traffic going the other way. And everybody just looks like, they look like we do in Los Angeles. Right. You know, the road rage, <laughs> the annoyance, the honking the horn. The, and I, so I'm stuck in this regular vibe traffic jam right. scenario. And I look out the right of my window and there's the Coliseum. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, this is so bizarre. And I feel like I want to like get out of my car. I wanted to get out of the van and honk the horn and make an announcement and be like, Romans, you it's okay. Right you see to your right, if you look to your right, you will see the ancient ruins of the glorious Coliseum. And you know, it's like, you're stuck in traffic, but look what's there. And it was so funny how for them, it's just the city yeah. they live in. It's yeah. just the everyday. And a traffic jam is still a traffic jam, Coliseum or no Coliseum. You Even know? though on the other end of that traffic jam, they're probably going to get to eat the best tomatoes in the world. They're going to get all that stuff. You're drink a foodie, the best, I know. Drink so. the best wine and eat the, I forget what they're called. Paul will tell you because he's the one that ordered them for us right. all the time. But they have these like fried artichokes in this mm. olive oil that we started every meal with, which is just like, yeah. That's what's waiting for them at the under, other end of the Coliseum traffic jam. <laughs> and yet there they are. <laughs> like, it's a universal language, the traffic jam. You're yeah. a foodie. Um, what, I am a total foodie. Yeah, tell me, uh, what would a typical sit down, we're getting back to the movies in a second, but okay. I'm a foodie too, so I want to ask you about yeah. that. What a typical sit down, so I come to Rachel's house for dinner, what do we eat? Well, first of all, you come to Rochelle's house. Rochelle's house, I'm sorry. Because it's a French name, yes. because I was grown up in Montreal. Uh, I, was, I was grown up in. You were grown up I was grown up, up in Montreal, um, where they named me Rochelle. <laughs> um, and uh, what would you have? You know, I actually am really big on um, seasonal ingredients, right. and that's one of the things I have the luxury of living in California. Yeah. It wasn't always like that. Right. Um, and I now have a real affection for um, the kind of cooking um, in any restaurant right. that I go into, the kind of cooking that embraces getting what is locally sourced right. and what is actually in season. And this is one of the things I loved about filming in Rome um, was their appreciation for something a small amount of something done incredibly well. Yeah. They don't eat pasta like we do. Yeah. You know, like an American portion of pasta is like for six people. Yeah, they yeah. put it in front of you and you're like, I don't know. And in, um, and when you go in Rome, you know, it's all handmade pasta. Mm -hmm. And if you're eating lasagna, you know, you get like a small little bit of it and you get a few forkfuls of spaghetti, but it's enough and it's really gorgeous olive oil. And, and Paul and Scott and I, um, Paul yeah. Chimati obviously yeah. and Scott Sweetman who are in the film, um, all of us when we were out trying to find our character and roaming the streets, uh, you know, roaming the streets of Rome <laughs> did a, um, till four in the morning. That's the kind of food we were eating right. and drinking wine and sort of finding our, our vibe yeah. in that environment was really an incredible thing because um, it influences what these characters would have experienced. Right. 
You know? Well, tell me a bit about Clara, because we know certain things about her. There's a scene where your father comes in and he kind of gives us a little bit of backstory. Uh -huh. um, obviously, the story is based on the very famous Mordecai Richler book, mm -hmm. so there's, there's stuff in the book as well. But what do you do to find that character? Because she's not entirely likable, but she's not entirely unlikable. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about her. In fact, maybe I'm a little conflicted about Clara, because I think that she was troubled, but... <laughs> I'm not exactly sure why. I love you so wanna, much right now. Maybe, I actually it made me want to hug her a little bit and go. Everything's going to be okay I, if you just. I so love you so much right now, and I actually got a little welled up because when you're if you're if you're saying that's how you felt about her, there's a little right. part of me that's going, oh my god, I think I might have succeeded a little, <laughs> which I never really feel. Right. Um, but you've sort of just described exactly what I was trying to convey, and right. I I think that's how Barney feels about her, yep. which is that um, you know I have these very these few. Um, these short scenes in which to bring to life a character um, and make an that, impression in a long and movie. make an impression yeah. in a long movie um, and you have to make an impression because it kind of sets the tone mm -hmm. for this sort of tragedy of, of Clara yeah. follows him and kind of haunts him a little throughout yeah. the film and and one of the things that I really had to convey in a short time about Clara is how is this a character who simultaneously repels you mm -hmm. Um, because she's so abrasive and there's clearly so much damage underneath that would compel Boogie to, you know, Scott, yeah, yeah. to be telling Paul, um, to be telling Barney, you know, stay away, it's trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and yet play a character who he would still, despite that, still end up in bed with. Yeah. And still go and marry. Well, and exactly. feel some desire to, he's like so repelled and yet wants to take care of her. My take on it was if she felt that she could really fall for Barney, mm -hmm. then she would be losing control or losing a part of herself that she didn't want to lose. A absolutely. I think when you, um, you know, when you really love someone or you really let someone take care of you, it's an extremely vulnerable experience. Right. Um, and what I got from the book, from, from the book and then had to try to put in, you know, in, in this um, screenplay that Michael Conovis has crafted so well, um, was the idea that I think there's a lot of, you know, Claire, there's a lot of shame involved mm -hmm. in, you know, Clara, thankfully I didn't have to, to I, it wasn't my job to convey her past because thankfully then Saul Rubinick comes yeah. in and does this beautiful job in of, a, in a five minute scene, in a five man. Minute yeah. scene and yeah. sums up everything that she went through and really gets it across and I love that scene. So I didn't have to explain all the reasons why Clara was damaged because that gets taken care of later. What I did have to do though, I think was, um, there's a certain amount of shame and embarrassment. I think there's a lot of it, actually, um, when someone endures what she endured and is mentally ill mm -hmm. in whatever level, yeah. on whatever level, um, and that she has to deal with that and then try to find a life where you're so damaged that you want somebody to take care of you and you want somebody to make it right and you want that, but you want it without having to reveal the things that happened to you right. because they're humiliating. So how do you let somebody know that you need taking care of while simultaneously letting them know that you know what, you're okay yeah. and you don't need them? It was a different time too. I mean, we're talking probably late 60s here when people didn't talk about mental illness and people didn't talk about uh, vulnerability and they didn't talk about things. It was oh, a in the book it's in the time. 50s. In I mean, the in the 50s, book yeah. it's so taboo. It's yeah. like you would never, nobody, those were not buzzwords. There was yeah, yeah. no, I mean, in that, it's no like full Oprah. frontal lobotomy in yeah. the, at that point, you know. Yeah. And even when you move forward to the 70s in our movie, it's still, yeah. um, you know, it's still not the kind of thing where she would have gotten the good care and, mm -hmm. you know, nurtured and gone to see a shrink and that would have been embraced and she wouldn't have gotten help that way. Thank you I was so great. Much. I could have talked to you forever. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely to chat. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you.